everyone. Good morning, school. Good morning, sir. You see this? I just want to welcome this morning a very special uh, guest, Dr. M. T. Suleiman, um, the head of the gift of the givers. And I'm not going to take much more of his time because I want him to address you. He has uh, two supporting uh, staff members, uh, one who's a parent of ours. We're proud to, to have uh, him on the stage as well. Um, I hope that you've read up a bit since I spoke to you on Monday about gift of the givers. So you can, Dr. Suleiman will talk a little bit about it, but we're chatting outside that he's going to really pick up on the projects that they're involved in around the world. Um, 46 countries, if you hadn't uh, picked that up, that's amazing. I was reading last night about that. And I think in my introduction this morning, I want to just uh, remind us that we sit in a very privileged position to be spoken to by a man who's taken the bull by the horns, who has looked at so many different situations around the world and in our country and has done something about it. And that I think is the motivation this morning. And if you, at the end of this morning, in a sense say, what happened? And wake up and say, I missed something. It's your loss. This morning, listen with your head, listen with your heart. And let's say that in 10 years time, you look back to this morning and say, something motivated me to get out and work with an organization like this or to start your own organization or to just do something. Our country is in need, our world is in need, and here, we we'll talk about that light at the end of the tunnel. Here we have a source of the light at the end of the tunnel in so many ways. So let's uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Suleiman this morning. We're really looking forward to the picture. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for that introduction. Good morning, boys and girls. It's a long time since I spoke at a school, a school hall. Okay. I want to go to the... I want to talk about different aspects of what I do, the basis, some of our international projects, the type of teams that we have, and then bring you to some of the local projects. And in the end, we can have some questions and answers about specific projects or anything else you want to ask about. Gift of the Givers is not my organization. I didn't get up one morning and said, okay, I think I should form an organization today. I'll write down some founding principles, get a constitution, write down some points, get some members, like how you normally form an organization, and said, okay, now I'm forming Gift of the Givers. It never was my intention ever to form an organization. It's very, very different. And this is some concept you, you will have to learn as you go along. It's called a spiritual basis. Spiritual basis meaning it comes through the universe, it comes to special instruction by inspiration. It's not something you plan, it happens for you. And you'll see it as I go along. It starts off in 1985. I was doing an internship in Tiago Hospital in Durban and I wanted to study medicine. Well, I was studying medicine, but I mean internal medicine. I was already a doctor. I wanted to do internal medicine to be a physician, to be a specialist. There was no post in the hospital. So I couldn't study further. I couldn't become a specialist physician. Now, let's stop there. In life, a lot of things don't work out. And you get upset, and you think it's not working out. But always apply your mind and look deeply into what didn't work out in your understanding. And sometimes, what didn't work out may actually be in your interest. So you always keep an open mind for that. We all come from different religions, different backgrounds. When we pray, one of the ways to pray is not to pray for what you want, but to pray for what is good for you. Because what you want may not necessarily be good for you. And as you get older and you learn, it applies to teachers, principles, management, you want a certain thing and you don't get it. It's very important. These are important principles in life. You want to do a certain course in varsity, but it doesn't work out, you do something else. You want to go to one school, it doesn't work out, you went to another school. So always, everything that you do, you must always keep the mind open to question what you are doing. So I didn't get the post. I was forced to do private practice. I went to Peter Marisburg in 1980s. I moved from Durban to Peter Marisburg in January 1986. And I did something that I didn't want to do. But I made the best of it. I was a doctor in private practice. I had a lot of patients. And I set up three practices and I went along. But there was a reason why I didn't do to specialize in internal medicine. Knowing what I do today, I would have never used it. At the same time that I moved to Bellsburg in January 1986, an Afrikaner guy from Pretoria also moved to Bellsburg. He came to teach French at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. 
My neighbor was a butcher, came to me one morning, and he said, I've got this African guy from Pretoria. He came to buy meat from me, but he needs a doctor. And I told him about you. So me and Mala, we meet. And we start speaking. Remember, I'm telling you, this is very spiritual, how it started, 1985. I was moved to Venezuela, which I was not supposed to do. I made a guy that comes from Pretoria. He was based in America and France, and he comes to Marisburg. And as we're speaking, one day Malik tells me, you need to go to Istanbul in Turkey to meet a spiritual teacher. So I joked with him. I said, Malik, it's 1986. I still haven't seen Cape Town. When am I going to see Istanbul or Turkey in Turkey? He said something very profound, and that applies to all aspects of living. He said, what God wills happens. There's a time and a place. And the time and place happened in August 91. I landed up in Turkey. I met a spiritual teacher. I saw people from all races, all religions, all countries, in a Muslim holy place. What was really amazing was the harmony, the love, no friction, no conflict, no judgmentalism, nobody judging each other. People said they don't believe, you're most welcome. Nobody judges anybody. It was an understanding of the human spirit. I fell in love with that. I came back in August 92. 6 August 1992 was the night gift of the givers was born. In two weeks time, three weeks time, we're 30 years old. Thursday evening, 10 p.m., 6 August 1992. The spiritual teacher is sitting in the corner of the room. I'm sitting the side. He makes eye contact and he looks heavenwards at the same time. In fluent Turkish, and I don't speak a word of Turkish, but I understood every single word of Turkish that he said that night. He said, my son, I'm not asking you, I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Wakifin. Translated, it means gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. But you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. In fact, in what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, expect to get a kick up your back. If you don't get a kick up your back, regard that as a bonus. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion, and mercy. And remember, the dignity of man is foremost. This operative word, dignity, is what we need to save this country. A lot of people have lost hope, they've lost dignity, and we have a role to play as students, as parents, as adults, to bring dignity back to people. And I'll come to that and give you the examples as we go along. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, provide water to the thirsty, and in everything that you do, applies to you guys, be the best at what you do. Not because of ego. That's the worst thing you can have. Not because of ego, because, but of, because of human suffering, human emotion, human life, and human dignity. Never do anything because of ego. That thing destroys the world, destroys people. He went on to say, again, this is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. And then he gave the most powerful spiritual message. He said, my son, remember that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. That everything I've done in 30 years, I know very clearly it's not humanly possible. Things are done through you. You have argue examples as you go along when it comes to the projects. Everything is done by you. I told you, I don't speak a word of Turkish. And I understood every word that he said in Turkish. At some point I asked him, teacher, how is it that when you speak Turkish, I understand, and when other people speak Turkish, I don't understand. He said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. So I said, now the matter of what I was, am I supposed to do? You gave me all these instructions. I'm a doctor in private practice. I have three surgeries in a place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. What am I supposed to do? And when am I supposed to do it? After hours, weekends, public holidays, long weekends, 
school holidays, when do I do what I'm supposed to do? He told me one line. You will know. What kind of answer is that? <laughs> you will know. For 30 years, I do know. What to do, what not to do, how to do, how not to do. In, in fact, the moment I walked out of that place on the 6th of August, it came by inspiration, respond to the civil war in Bosnia. In the same month, I took in 32 containers of aid into a war zone in Bosnia. In November of the same year, we took in eight containers of warm items in the war. And in February 93, we designed the world's first containerized mobile hospital. The first, world's first, a product of South African technology, a product of South African engineering, a product of Africa, and taken into Europe, into Bosnia. Now, how many of you believe in yourselves? How many of you believe in our country, in our skills, in our capability? The country has its problems, but it doesn't take away our talent, our skills, our capabilities. We need to believe in ourselves. That hospital was built in, Bosnia, in South Africa and taken to Bosnia. When CNN filmed the hospital, the CNN commentator said on the 1st of February 1994 that the South African mobile hospital is equivalent to any of the best hospitals in Europe. This is what our country and our skill and our personnel are capable of. We need to believe in ourselves. But what those three missions, August, November, February 93, Bosnia, the message came clear to me. I now understood what we had to do. Gift of the givers in essence was going to be a disaster response agency. We are the largest disaster response agency of African origin on the African continent. And as time went on, we added to the growth of the organization. We put on several projects, wheelchairs, food parcel, feeding schemes, counseling, water products, a whole lot of things. But we never had medical teams. This is where we need skills. In 2004, for the first time with the tsunami, we took medical teams, a primary healthcare team, into Somalia, on the northeast of Somalia, in a place called Afun. Eight months later, we took a primary healthcare team again to a place called Niger. And this is a very interesting story to understand how fortunate we are. We got to a country where thousands of children were dying daily because of famine and what was left of the crops, the lo locusts destroyed. When the medical teams went in and we made an announcement, there's a team here from South Africa, hundreds of patients came. But there was something unique about the makeup of the patients. There were no adult males, no teenagers, no children over the years, age of five, and no mother who brought a baby asked for medical treatment. I couldn't understand that. And secondly, when we realized there's so many patients here, how are you going to see all those children? And you only a limited amount of doctors. So I went into the queues and we called triage. When you've been in disasters, you've got to think on your feet, you've got to be very practical, and you've got to be very effective. So I walked through the crowds, I looked at the baby, I tell the mother, because we couldn't speak the language. So I point to the child, we tell the mother, and we said, the mother understood immediately. My child is okay, I don't have to worry, I can leave the queue. And she gives a big smile and she walks out. So I said, let me try this again. Number seven, number 10, number 15, number 20, and all the medical guys started doing that. And they all left. That evening when we had a meeting, one of the guys gets up and says, Dr. Suleiman, I went to the village of Tilaberi. In every village, five to 10 children were dying a day. And I now understood why no adult male came, why no mother took treatment, why no teenager took treatment, why the mother walked out of the queue. Because there was no guarantee another medical team was coming. There was no guarantee more food was coming. There was no guarantee no medicine was coming. But they sacrificed the child that was not so sick because they knew we had less resources and less medical teams. So they allowed us to see the very sick children and took the other children who were not so sick away who could die in the next five or seven or ten days. It was a supreme sacrifice to save somebody, to give up my child so somebody else's child can live. Can live. We saved every single child in that, in that mission because of the Ubuntu spirit, the generosity, the selflessness of those people so that somebody else's child can live. Two months later, we got involved in the earthquake in Pakistan, 8 October 2005. A massive earthquake hits the mountain 
from Rawalpindi right up to Kashmir. Gautak city, an entire province, an entire region was affected. We upgraded. No more primary health care only. Primary health care, trauma, orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, gynecologists, theater nurses, ICU nurses, nurses post-op rehab teams. We all went together. When we get there, then we land in the airport. The Pakistani general says, do you mind not going to the earthquake? So I asked him, which hospital will you give us? And he said, I'll give you the cantonment hospital of Rawalpindi. So he says, you understand? I said, yes. So my teams ask, what's going on? I said, this earthquake is so bad that in the mountains, everything is destroyed. Most people have died. There's nobody to save. But we need to stabilize those who are alive and ask them, do you have helicopters? And they said, sorry, all our helicopters are emergency missions. Again, in disasters, you think on your feet. You must always make a plan. So I look around the airport, and I see the American Air Force. So I go to them, I see a big black guy. I said, my brother, <laughs> where are you from? I know where that is from. He says he's from America. I say, no, you're black. You're from Africa. He says, yes, I'm originally from Africa. I said, me too, I'm from Africa. We have brothers and we have each other. <laughs> I'm making a plan now. So I says, I need a helicopter, can you help me? You, my brother, take three. In two minutes, he gave me three helicopters. <laughs> and we put the teams in the helicopters and we send them to the mountain. The other team goes down to start preparing the hospital, the Kentonman Hospital of Rawalpindi. As we walk in, we get the stench of death, the stench of gangrene. Children on the trolley with no parents, no IV lines, no medication, no nursing staff, no disinfectant, no linen. And I call a Pakistani general and I said, what's going on here? Is this an organized killing field? What can we do here? The superintendent comes running and says, very sorry, this hospital is shutting down. I said, you guys are mad. It's an earthquake, it's an emergency, you need every hospital you can use. So they asked, what can we do? So I said, if I give you the shopping list, will you bring this and we'll show you what we can do. He brings the shopping list. A hospital that was shutting down, a South African medical team converted it into a 400 bed emergency hospital in 24 hours. We did 75 operations a day and we saved hundreds of lives. For that intervention, we got a presidential award from the Pakistan president in 2006. But it showed the dedication and commitment of our personnel, studied in schools like your school, studied in universities in this country, trained in hospitals in this country because of the skill that we had. We always have race issues and religious issues. Something very unique happened in December that year. A lady called Karina Extian, Africana, Christian, white lady from Pretoria calls me, from the University of Pretoria. And she says, Dr. Suleiman, I want to help the people of Pakistan. I'm a spinal rehab specialist. So I told her, Karina, when would you like to go? She tells me on Christmas. I said, you can't be feeling well. <laughs> You're a Christian lady, and on Christmas you want to go to Pakistan, to a Muslim country? No, you can't be feeling well. She says, that's the only time I have leave. And Karina goes to Pakistan. Kids who couldn't walk, she made them walk. Adults who will never walk again, they will walk. She carried the spirit of Ubuntu from South Africa into Pakistan. So much so that when she finished off, the patients, the doctors, the nurses, the families, and even the military cried. Here was a lady who gave her heart and soul to help somebody in another country. What great skill and expertise. There was no issue about religion, about race, about color, about geography, or location. She went and did a supreme job. In 2000, when we finished off, I said, you always got to think forward. There was something missing in each of the givers in disaster response. We didn't have search and rescue teams. We didn't have a search dog. We went to the medical team, but at seconds, you first got to take the people out of the rubble before you do the second part. So we planned for it. 2010, 12 January, the earthquake hit Haiti, port of france It's a massive earthquake. Killed 250,000 people in 40 seconds. Search and rescue teams got ready. We had them now. We flew them to France. 
and but we were making arrangements from there to go to Haiti. I knew they will not get into Haiti. I spoke to Air France and I said, can you give me a guarantee in writing that you'll get my, terms into, uh, my teams into port au -Prince? They said, yes, and they gave me a guarantee in writing. I said, you're going to regret that. They said, the airport is open. I said, it's going to close. They said, it's open. I said, it's going to close. And then they gave me the guarantee. My teams go to the airport. I knew they never going to get to port au -Prince. So in the meantime, I make alternative arrangements. I'm in Peter Marysburg. I phone the Catholic Society of Johannesburg. And I tell the guy answer the phone, I need the Pope. But that guy gets a little confused. What does the Muslim guy want the Pope for? <laughs> Did I say to him, are you Christian guys not connected? We Muslims are connected all over the world. <laughs> now I feel a little embarrassed. So he says, what do you want the Pope for? I said, I want the Catholic organization to meet my teams in the Dominican Republic. Not Port of France and Haiti, in the Dominican Republic. And take them across the road into Haiti. Three hours later, he says, Caritas and Catholic Relief Services will meet your teams inside Dominican Republic. My teams land in Paris. They send a message, there's a problem. I said, I know there's a problem. The airport is closed, hasn't it? They said, yes, the airport is closed in port au -Prince. I said, don't worry, the arrangements are made. You guys are flying the next two hours <coughs> to Dominican Republic. And here's the contact number. They get to Dominican Republic. Remember, this is a cross race, a cross country, across religion. This is about humanity, working hand in hand together in the interest of the people of this world. So if they get to public the public, there's a board, South African team, welcome. Accommodation, water, food, visa, and a team to join together. And the Mexican team, Mexican team joins us. And we go inside Haiti, there's looting, there's shooting in the streets, there's difficulty, there's mayhem, there's death and smell everywhere. The teams go in, Eight days into the earthquake, the South African team makes world history. In the Catholic Church that collapsed, the yes sounds in the rubble. Eight days after the earthquake, no oxygen, no food, no water, fractured hip and fully enclosed in rubble. 64-year-old Anna Zezi is pulled out alive from the Catholic Church that collapsed by the South African gift of the Jewish team. And the first word she says to my team, I love God. You instill hope in a person several thousand kilometers away. And the second thing she says, I love you. It was the world first. Never before in the history of the world has any African team taken anybody out of the rubber alive in an earthquake outside the African continent. Our team was the first in the world to do that. And they warn the support and blessings of everyone. The medical team now stops in behind the search and rescue teams. Countries from teams from northern countries from Europe and America said, we can't do this. Everything is destroyed. The South African team stepped forward and they said, we can do this. So the orthopedic surgeon asked for a drill to do orthopedic surgery. And they gave him a black and decker that used for carpentry. The doctor stepped forward and they said, we can use it. The Burmaka plan. <laughs> And they went inside and the patients, the patients who came and all the people from the northern countries said, if you want healing and you want help and you want assistance, then go to the dream team. And the dream team is from South Africa, trained in schools like yours, trained in universities like ours, <laughs> trained in our country like ours. There's a great future in this country. There's great skills. We just need to believe in the system. 2011, and this is the last international story I'll give you. We went into Somalia. Your school collected money for Somalia in 2011. You guys are probably not here yet, right? In 2011, kids walked 400 kilometers in search of water and in food. And in the process, while they were walking, they got tired. Or the mother got tired. Or the father got tired, and they left them on the way. The children who had to leave their brothers and sisters and walk on. If they stay, they all die. They had to make a very difficult decision. So some who could manage walked and carried on and others left behind. So when they got to our camp, our hospital facility in, in Mogadishu, we asked them, how many were you? All my brothers left behind, my sisters left behind, my brothers left behind. What happened to them? They probably died. They had to make that kind of sacrifice to go forward. We don't understand what suffering is all about. We don't understand what hardship is all about. 
we need to learn to be grateful, to appreciate what we have, what our parents are doing for us, what our teachers are doing for us, what families are doing for us. People are in great, great difficulty. Let's fast forward to 2017. We got involved in the fire in Nizona. We sent in two ladies who are project managers. Together with the people of the city, we delivered 20,000 food parcels, blankets, hygiene packs, sanitary pads, and diapers. Whilst doing that, we sent in firefighters. We supported 1,200 firefighters twice a day with water, liquids, energy biscuits, and meals. We sent in advanced life support ambulance, advanced life support paramedics, specialized medical teams to help the doc move patients from Nizla to other hospitals. And why should we do all that? Somebody came and said, but you know, the cat and the dog is also hungry. So we arranged cat food and dog food. Then somebody else came and said, but what about the cow? And what about the sheep? And what about the pig? And what about the horse? And what about the elephants in the elephant park? And what about the animals in the wild? I said, anything else? <laughs> we arranged all that stuff for all those animals. As part of humanity, it's an essential part to look after creation. But the animals can't talk. And we sent assistance for them. <laughs> then we had a classic. A guy walks into the, 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 the checkers gave us the car park where we had the whole facility, our warehouse. A guy walks into the checkers facility and he says, I didn't get sugar. So I said, Emily, why this man didn't get sugar? Emily says, the sugar was finished, but it's coming. So I said, Grant, the sugar is coming. He said, it's not for me. So I said, who's it for? He said, for the bees. I said, is this man drunk? <laughs> So it's very busy sugar. I said, oh, just give me sugar. I don't know what he's talking about. I go away that night, and I said, no, the story is incomplete. The next morning, I come to, I phone Grant, I said, please come back. Grant comes back, and he gives me a very interesting story. He says, Dr. Suleiman, you see why the fire was so big? There's drought here in nice now. So all the plants that the bees feed on are gone. When the fire came, 300 beehives burnt. Each beehive holds 75,000 to 80,000 bees. We lost 22 million bees. We said that Cape Bee, honeybee, is the most versatile bee in the world. It can take any difficulty, any infection. It's very resilient. But a fire destroyed it. That bee is haploid and deployed. Meaning that if the queen bee dies, it can make a new queen bee. So I said, how does the sugar, what is the explanation about the sugar? He said, when there's no plant, you use a nectar pollen substitute, but it's very expensive. So the only other way to save the bee is to make a sugar solution, and the bee feeds on a sugar solution. And then I understood why he asked me for sugar. We gave him money to grow plants, but that's not what happened in one day's time. It's a long-term thing. Gave beehives, gave him nectar pollen substitute, and gave him 30 tons of sugar for the bees. From there, we got involved in Sutherland. A lot of you like sheep. Sutherland got merino sheep. The sheep count, because of the drought, fell from 440,000 to 31,000. We sent in fodder into, into, into Sutherland. We drilled 238 balls to save the farmers, to bring in water. And from January this year, for the first time, after we gave them 45 pellets, Nutrified, uh, fortified nutrition pellets for the, the sheep to eat. For the first time this year, since 2017, the sheep count is starting to rise. In, the, in 2018, we got involved in your city for day zero. We drilled boreholes, brought in 300 containers of, of bottled water on ship and on road to Cape Town. In 2019, the drought hit Eastern, Eastern Cape in a big way. It was there before, but it was more pronounced. Makanda, you know, is Grangetown. The university was in trouble, the bed and breakfast was in trouble, the town was in trouble, we drilled 15 boreholes, put in water takers and we're still busy. And 2020 came the great challenge, when COVID came. We got involved in 210 hospitals in the country, supporting medical staff, putting in PPEs, upgrading hospitals, putting oxygen facilities, putting COVID dedicated facilities, putting beds, mattresses, blankets, linen, curtains, boreholes in schools, uh, in, sorry, in hospitals, scrubs, to help upgrade the system in the hospital systems because people were dying in, in the car parks, they were dying in their cars, they were dying in the casualty, they were dying in the beds, they were dying at home, they were dying in the ambulances. They needed oxygen. We put in thousands of oxygen machines to help save and kids, adults, everybody was affected. 
2021, we had a civil unrest in Devon. Kids went to, to look at the shops. They were not violent. They were not aggressive. There were children who had no shoes. I'm not condoning looting. But it is an indication to us the difficulty that children have and people have. In a place called Petty, in June 2020, when our teams went to give a food parcel to a mother, the mother said, talk to spoke to Ali. They said, talk to my children, my three children. They will tell you the taste of every plant in this area. This is South Africa, a country of gold and diamonds and big cities and big shops and big malls. The kids were eating plants to survive. When you went to the dump, when the dump trucks came, the children were running, they should be at school. But of course schools were closed, but when even the schools were open, they were running in the dumps behind the trucks to search what they can eat. A child took a finger in a peanut butter bottle. You know, we always leave something there and we never finish the whole thing. I put a finger, eating. Found a jam tin, which is serrated and cut your lips. I put a finger inside and started eating jam. One small dot of jam because the child was starving. When we started supporting hundreds of soup kitchens, 10 kids came and the kitchen became bigger and bigger and bigger and then adults also started coming. A small frail kid came, no shoes, winter, no tall shirt, no jersey, shaking like this, came to the front of the queue. Look at the dignity, look at the thoughtfulness of the child that's hungry, and then, and said, don't give me too much of food. I won't eat too much. But can you give me something for my mother and my father, and my brother and sister at home? They haven't eaten for days. And we said, take whatever you want. Eat whatever you want, and take it home. The child was prepared to sacrifice for the sake of that mother and father. Right now, every day, there's children dying of malnutrition in the Eastern Cape. They are so used to hunger that they don't know the danger signs of hunger in the rural areas. It's too late. We've partnered the Department of Health to educate, to send in dietitians, to send in nutrition food. God is great. We used to buy what is called an easy peanut paste. You open the packet, you squeeze it in your mouth, it's, it's fortified, it's nutrition, it feels we've got a good taste. So we were buying that and we put it on our social media pages. The product that we were using, the company from Norway, saw the post on our social media pages. And they called us and we and said, we like to help. We said, we'll appreciate any help. They sent us 15 containers of peanut paste valued at 25 million rand which we can send into all those kids and not adults starving in the Eastern Cape. Yet, in March, in April, after the first lockdown, Nonzamo in Strand, the old people were waiting in the queue, right, social distancing. So instead of walking 10 people in one line, you got one person every meter away. Everything takes longer. The curfew starts at eight o'clock. It was a freezing cold night. And the old people were waiting in the queue wanted to get their food parcel because there was no more money, no jobs, the pension thing was delayed. And at 8 o'clock, after 8, the police comes to Ali and says, curfew, time is up. There's hundreds of old people standing in the queue. He phones me, I told the police, you can stand on the head, lock us up, do what they want, we're not stopping. We can't send old people home hungry. They came in this queue because they are hungry. And they probably got children and grandchildren home to feed. To the credit of the police, every policeman is not a crook. Every policeman is not corrupt. Policemen take bullets in the day, and when they come home, they dead. The child comes, the father comes, comes home after school, the father is dead, the mother is dead. He gave his life, or she gave his life, in the service in the line of duty. Every policeman is not a bad man. In Henley Dam, when the floods happen, the police dive a lady dies in the dam to find the body of a child and the body of an adult. The lady drowned in the dam. She got two kids, small ones. Their mother is not coming back home. Don't write everybody off. The policeman, to his credit, says, you are right. I will bring in reinforcements to help these old people, to give them the food parcel, to put it in the van and to deliver it to his house. 
The last old lady gets her food parcel at half past twelve at night in the freezing cold. And she gives a big smile to Ali. And she says, I'm going home now and I'm going to wake my grandchildren up. So he says, why? He said, she said, I promised them I'm coming home with something for them tonight. They haven't eaten for three days. Have people stayed without food for three days? There's people who are going through great difficulty in this country. And she goes and takes a food parcel for them. Appreciate everything that you have. Don't be wasteful. Be grateful. Use your talent to help somebody else. When my teams ask me, when they go overseas, I don't take them anymore. I used to lead the teams, but I'm getting old now. Man got a beard now. He's getting gray. I'm going to die sometime. I have to teach the new generation. And when they get across, they ask me, what must we do? I tell them one, one point only. If it's your daughter, your mother, or your grandparent, what would you do for them? If you know what to do for them, you know what to do for anybody in any difficulty, in any crisis, in any way in the world. What you want somebody to do to you, you do, do, do that to other people. And finally, we got called to the province of far from here, Nelson Mandela Bay. The dams were drying out. The municipality called us. We went in and in 15 minutes we made a program how to save the city. We can't save the city totally, but you have to work together. What government, what corporates, what the people to save water, and our engineering teams and our ball teams. In one month, we've drilled 13 boreholes, opened up another seven, brought in water tankers, getting water from a desalination plant, putting up Jojo tanks everywhere, and right now, as we stand, we've added seven million liters of water a day to the city. But the success of the, of the intervention is dependent on people saving water. Cape Town is a fantastic example of how citizens were disciplined. All of you stood to your 50 liters a day. All of you had your one minute and two minute showers. Stop washing the cars, stop putting water in the garden. And because there was a collective effort from everybody, because people were disciplined, because we're a community, because we want humanity, because we want nation, you saved this city from collapsing. And now it's a pleasure. I hate the traffic. But today I'm happy to see traffic. Because it means somebody's working. It means somebody's got jobs. It means the economy is turning around. You can see the tourists coming back. If you've got the means, give the car guard a little more. If you go to the shop and you buy something from the restaurant, give the waiter a little more. Wherever you can give something and you've got the means, give a little more. Because these people got a child like you to feed. They're going to buy stationery for a child like you. They're going to buy a jersey for a child like you. They're going to buy medicine for a child like you. So if you have the means and your parents have the means, help each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman. We are now going to enter into a time of questions and answers. So we have a few roving mics. Uh, if the mic doesn't get to you, then please just uh, be sure to ask your question very loudly. All right. Don't be shy. Okay, we have a question right on this side. So perhaps ask your question anyway, it's going to take a while. Let's start with this one without the mic and then we'll go to that one with the mic. What was the name of the spiritual leader you met in Istanbul? You're listening very carefully. Yeah. His name was Muhammad Safe Afendi, Turkish name. You try it, next one. <laughs> um, oh, jeez. As somebody who's been like involved in hostage cases such as the Yolanda Korki case, how do you go about when you find out that, for example, a South African citizen has been kidnapped by a terrorist group, how do you go about starting negotiations and making contact with them to save somebody like that? You guys are reading a lot of stuff. <laughs> the teacher said, you all know. We've got no experience in hostage negotiations. Yolani Koki was taken in 2012, May 27th. 
sorry, May 13, 2013. That's right, yeah. I just come back from Syria in April 2013. My project manager from Yemen, I brought him to Syria because he's an Arab, he's a journalist and he speaks the language. He gets back from Syria and he tells me on that date there's a South African taken hostage, a South African couple taken hostage inside uh, Yemen. And he tells me, what do we do? So I said, our motto says, best among people are those who benefit mankind. So I said, this fits in that category. The government is not going to negotiate. The government said they don't talk to terrorists. So if nobody's going to do anything, they're going to stay there for the rest of their lives. So I said, let's start. We had an advantage in Yemen because I have an office there. And because I, right. because I have an office there, we were doing aid into the country. So we had leverage. The president knew us, the military knew us, the police knew us, the public knew us, the tribal leaders knew us, the media knew us. So what we did, I started increasing the amount of aid. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Starting aid and we started distributing aid all over. But every time, Anas, his name is Anas Azamati, every time he gave aid out, he made a media announcement. You know, there's something in this country that is, we don't know who took them. It was it Al-Qaeda? Was it a grudge? Was just some small time kidnappers? There's different categories. So we said, let's assume the worst case scenario and say it's Al-Qaeda. We have to prepare for the worst situation. So he made an announcement, somebody, somebody has taken across to two, two South Africans. Please call me and he puts his number in the media every day. May up to December, nothing happened. 6 January 2014, he gets a call. Are you the guy that's in the media every time telling us there's two South Africans taken hostage? We have him. Come tomorrow to Aden, 10 a.m., come alone. So he comes to Aden, the next day, 10 o'clock in the morning, waits a while in the car, and then he gets called to come to a certain place. The moment he walks, remember, he doesn't know who they are. We don't know who took the people. The moment they walk in, his welcome message was, we are Al-Qaeda, and you know what we're capable of. But we had a plan. He took all the pictures of everything that we did. You're talking to terrorists and you're showing them feeding schemes, hospital, water, because we had nothing to negotiate with, and I was not going to pay any to ransom. So he sits down there and they allowed him to communicate with me whilst he was talking to them. And he said, I said, watch the body, you know, uh, body moves, watch the face, watch the emotions. He said, look, it sounds friendly at the moment. Okay, what do you want? We want this, you got a man and a woman. He was a woman, she's a mother, she's got children, she needs to go home. They said, okay, you can have her, $3 million. So we said, we don't pay ransom. Showed him the pictures, we, we said, we've done more than $3 million of work, of worth of work in this country. This has benefited your family, and your children, and your grandfather. So they just look at him like that. They said, okay, we have to talk to the elders. We'll get back to you. Come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow, nobody meets him. He sits in the car the whole day. Come back Thursday. Give us $10,000. I said, no, not even $1. Phone back a little later. Maybe we'll give you free. Maybe we won't give you free. Maybe we'll release her. Maybe we won't release her. Maybe we'll ask for money. Maybe we won't ask for money. So you never show what they're talking about. Suddenly they tend to come 10 o'clock at night on a Thursday. They blindfold him. Eight guys with guns put him in a car. And they go into the middle of the desert. And one, at, 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 just before 12 o'clock, he sends me a message. He says, they're releasing Yolandi. I said, but Yolandi doesn't know who you are. How is she going to know how safe she is? Because what happens, quite often, a tenor group takes you and sells you to somebody else. And they put a mark up. And then that person sells you to somebody else and they put a mark up. So you never know where you're going. So I said, I need to talk to Yolandi. She doesn't know me either. But I can talk as a South African accent, she'll hear me. My voice. So he tells them, I need to talk to Yolandi. They agreed. At 10 to 12, 6, 7, 8, 9, on, on, on Ju July, uh, January 10th, I get a call. And the man just says, pardon, and he gives Yolanda the phone. And she asked me in Afrikaans, VSD. So I told her, I'm Dr. Suleiman. Vast McKinnons, I said, in free state. When they took the mother and the father, the children were at home. So up till that date, she didn't know whether her children were taken captive or not. So I told her, no, your children are safe. They were in the house. The government took them, they put them in a flat, and these are your family members in, in Bluefontein. They kept the calm. They kept to the point, they released Yulani, but they took her without Pierre. She was heartbroken. Does she come home? Does she stay to work for Pierre? They passed Yulani on to Anas. 
and they tell him, when they tell her, you have eight days, three million dollars, otherwise we give you Priya's head in a box. It's a long story, but this is the beginning. We got, we, we, on the 6th of December 2014, we secured Priya's release. No money. He was coming home. I used all the tribal leaders to put pressure on Al-Qaeda. To say that you're crossing our territory, you can't cross our territory if you don't release Pierre Koki. They agreed. That same morning, the American naval forces went in. And in the shootout, both Pierre Koki and Luke Summers, the American hostage, both died. He was coming home that day. We had secured this hostage. We would have to get Stephen McGowan out. We would have to get the, the guy from Sweden, his name will come back to me, a Swedish hostage out. I mean, if we were involved in some hostage situations in Somalia also. Thank you. Um, if you were elected the president of South Africa, what would you do in your first 100 days? I'll fire up the civil service. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with ESCOM, home affairs, and discussing. <laughs> when I was an elected president of South Africa, I was set about putting up a budget for infrastructure upgrade in this country. Bring about social cohesion, make sure there's better management systems in all government facilities, meaning hospitals, schools, and making sure I invest money in personnel because a country can't run without personnel and skilled personnel. I invite all the South Africans who left the country to come back safely, to come back and work, create opportunities. I need skills, I need experience. Hospitals are falling apart for five reasons. They don't have management, they don't have maintenance, they don't have enough healthcare workers, they don't have enough medical equipment and medicines and supplies, and the infrastructure is falling apart. Those are five things you have to fix up in all hospitals. Schools got a similar problem all over. Increase the security in the country, open the market to opt for, 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 for tourism, for, but make it safe, put more people in the police force, and I'll shut down departments in the university. I'll close several departments in the university that are not productive. I can't have children studying for four, five years, and six years. Their parents go into a lot of debt, bonding their houses, paying for the cars, borrowing money from the, from the, oh, the company, and they can't pay back. Because kids are taking a dead-end course. When they come out after five or six years, there's no job. They get frustrated, they get disillusioned. I would say the country needs these jobs. Doctors, nurses, dietitians, pediatricians, paramedics, not pediatricians, friends of the doctors. Paramedics, OT, physiotherapy, special learning skills. We need accountants, we need managers, we need people, electricians, plumbers, woodworkers. And put people in that kind of field and teachers. 2,000 teachers died during the COVID, more than the medical workers. There's more children in school, but there's less teachers. So we'll do infrastructure upgrade, put in more schools, more classes, more teachers, more specialized teachers to teach the kids. I'll train hundreds of psychologists. Universities have a policy most of them take 21 psychologists, 21 students to do masters in psychology, seven educational, seven counseling, and seven clinical psychologists. You can't have seven clinical psychologists or counseling psychologists when the entire country is suffering from some kind of mental disorder, from COVID, from loss of loved ones, the police, the healthcare workers, the teachers, the kids, the parents have lost, the children and children have lost parents. We need to train psychologists. We need socially in, uh, in, uh, impacting jobs. So you put in 20,000 policemen, you're fighting security, and it's a job. You put in teachers, you're teaching, it's a job, and plus teaching kids. You put in healthcare workers, it's saving lives, and it's a job. I'll direct it towards that kind of stuff. And then I'll reignite textile industry. We kill the textile industry by importing from China. We put, I'll support the cotton farmers and get the cotton farmers going again. We'll have thousands of jobs in the cotton farmers. We have textiles locally. We'll support the local economy. I'll reactivate the leather industry. The leather industry got killed. It takes thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs. Thirdly, I support farming in a big way. The more people learn farming, it's labor intensive. It's job creation. It supports 18.2% of agriculture and the GDP in the country. And I'll do massive infrastructure pro pro projects to put people in the construction industry. When all this happens, the tax base will increase. More people will pay taxes. Less people will be on the social grant system. I'm already speaking to medical aid societies and private hospitals to reduce their prices. So more people can get onto medical aid. We can put in another 10 million people onto medical aid and at entry level, which means 10 million people more are not dependent on public health. It takes the pressure off the health system. And there's many other things that you can do. Eventually the tax base will increase, more people will have jobs, 
more money will come in, we fix up more things, and number one, of course, we're going to the police services now. We could be going to, we're going to fund 60 dogs. The dogs are trained in search and rescue, they train in finding criminals, in drugs, explosions, animation, and, and a whole lot of different things. And I was joking with the police services. I said, the number one thing we're going to fight is corruption, and I need to train a dog that can smell corruption. <laughs> that dog, I'm prepared to fund any amount of money. So those are the most important things you need to do to save the country as part of the, of the plan. Where is the guy? Where is the guy who asked me the question? One more. I got the police. Yeah, one more question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, sir, I wanted to ask: um, during times when you get sponsors and that the government gives you things that you need to hand out to the communities. How do you ensure that corruption doesn't take place? How do you ensure that everyone gets what they deserve, everyone gets what they're supposed to be getting during times like the KZN floods and COVID because that's when corruption was happening like a lot. So how does your organization make sure that everyone gets what they deserve? We're 30 years in the business. We have networks on the ground. We work with councils, we work with community leaders, we work with religious leaders. We go to every site ourselves. We meet the people ourselves. We identify them ourselves. And the people themselves choose the recipients. And they will say, this one, not that one. They all get vouchers. They all get the same item exactly. So there's no discrimination. So everybody is selected by the community themselves. So when the day that we come, there's no unrest, no friction, no discord, because they chose the people. And it's verified by the, the, the councils themselves and the community leaders and the religious leaders. So in that way, we've never had one friction in 30 years of our delivery. And nobody complained when they took the parcel because we did it to ourselves. There's no corruption. We don't give stuff. And by the way, government doesn't give us anything. We give government things. It's the other way around. <laughs> we deliver the things ourselves, and that's why there's no issue. Sorry, I have to go. There was still a provincial police commissioner. Provincial police commissioner is waiting for us. We've got a meeting with them in the management now. At 9 o'clock, and I moved it to our person night. Thank you. Wasted, I would really just like to thank you, Dr. Sinman. I think you are truly an inspiration to all of us. And not just thanking you for taking time out of your day to be here, but also all your huma humanitarian work across the world. And I think I can also speak from the pupils that I think you've shown us that we can really serve unconditionally with what we have and do what we can with that. You really are. Thank you. Make sure you guys study the way out. You lost two years of COVID time. Catch it up on extra work. Do your best. Learn well and serve others. Thank you.